Good morning, everybody. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with me, my name is Dan. I'm honored to serve as pastor here and also get the, the um, humbling privilege of sharing the main message today. And um, I realized I wanted to start today by telling you what's happening, a little bit about what's happening in my family and, and what my kids are doing to me, my adult kids are doing to me. I was triggered by St. Patrick's Day. So my, my, um, my kids are half Italian, that's my wife's side, and then they're 50% French, Irish, German, English, Swedish, and Welsh. <laughs> and you know what I hear my kids telling people when they're asked what ethnicity they are? They say they're Italian. They publicly disown their heritage. And all of you Italians nodding like you're the only ethnicity on the planet. They do that to me. Okay, okay. I haven't heard it recently. I think they're a little bit more subtle about it because they know how much it breaks my heart and God's heart, honestly, who made all ethnicities equal. Um, the identity aspect of our lives is obviously not just race, ethnicity. Um, the identity part of our lives matters so fundamentally and so foundationally that you and I, whether we know it or not, are building ourselves around some kind of identity, right? And on the surface, it's so natural for us to think of our race our heritage, uh, our background, our sex, gender, and culture as who we are. That's how we identify ourselves. Also, you may discover how you identify yourself just by asking this question, how do you, ad how do you introduce yourself to people? Uh, you might say, you tell people, I'm a mom. You might tell people, I'm a grandma. You might tell people, uh, I'm an engineer or a teacher. Or one way to think about the way that other people think of your identity is to listen to the way somebody introduces you to somebody else. And they say, this is my friend or my sister or my so-and-so, and they're a, and they might, they might um, kind of mention your expertise, uh, your expertise, they're a good cook, they're an outdoorsman. Um, I hear people introducing me as a world-class speaker. I mean, that's just who people identify. Sometimes they identify you as a specific thing. You have to listen carefully. Today, I read a headline that one of, our vice, uh, one of our presidential candidates has named a vice president, and the headline said, they were a wealthy attorney. And I thought to myself, that's how people think of this person. And that person probably sees themselves as a wealthy attorney. Much of our culture now isn't only thinking of themselves in those terms. They're actually uh, perceiving their identity, and they're self-constructing their identity on what they do, what they achieve, and how they feel, right? So they are self-determining and self-designing their own identity based on perception or based on achievement. They perceive it or achieve it. Got that? Follow me on that? That's one way that identity is formed among us autonomously self-designed and self-determined identities. These are based on feelings and they're based on choices. Christians, and this is, this is so important, important enough for us to spend a few Sundays on this topic. Christians are different. We received our identity. Our identity isn't achieved or perceived. We receive it. Um, that in and of itself, that truth, if you were to accept that truth, that's a life-changing truth that is helpful for anybody, and it's defined not by what you do for God, but it's defined by what God has done for you. And it's such a thrill for me to have the opportunity to tell you this morning what God has revealed to us about identity formation, who He is, and also what he's done, and how that makes us who we are. And I can hardly restrain myself to tell you these truths. And my prayer, my hope is that they are so transformative that it begins or advances and bears fruit in your life in the very core of who you are. And I am concerned that if you miss these truths, 
it leaves you empty, alone, and uh, uh, searching and searching and searching your entire life. Decades of trying to achieve and perceive who you are. Achieve and perceive who you are. Decades of that. And while doing that, missing out on who God's made you to be and missing out on all the fruit of having known that, discovered that, and accepted that. Don't miss this. Christians are expected to live radically new lives, radically different lives than people who don't yet know Jesus. And the reason is because Christians are radically new people. One of the most compelling verses that you might come across in the New Testament is a letter is in the letter written to the church at Corinth. And Paul is describing what happens when you're born again. When you belong to Jesus and you're joined to Jesus by the Holy Spirit and you are regenerated, you have a new heart, here's what he says. He says, this means that anyone who belongs to Jesus has become a new person. Not just a different person, but a new person. And um, new is different from just getting an upgrade. This person, uh, he goes on to say, the old life is gone, he's referring to our identity, and the new one has begun. What does that mean? What does that mean for us? In this four-part message series, we're going to look at our gospel identity, and we'll look together at our new identity that Christians receive that's based on who God is and what He's done for us through the work of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we start by recognizing and acknowledging, I should say, acknowledging who we are apart from Jesus. In other words, when we become a new creation, and He says the old is gone, who is the old person? Do you know that God describes to us who we were before Jesus, and He uses words like enmity, an enemy of God. There's pictures of being estranged from the creator of the universe, isolated and alone. And before Jesus, those are our life experiences. We're dead in our selfish sin. We're rebelliously autonomous. I've mentioned this a couple of Sundays ago that uh, I've heard sin portrayed this way. If you don't quite know what sin means, it basically is this. It's saying to the creator of the universe who made you in his image, leave me alone. Just leave me alone. In other words, I am going to live my life for my reasons and for my glory. I'm doing my own thing. And you might say, well, where is that? Really, you can go all the way back to Adam and Eve's initial sin, and that's what they were saying. God, leave me alone. I'm going to do my thing my way for my glory. I'm going to make it up as I go along. And the things that I think are right are right, and the things I think are wrong are wrong. I'm determining who I am and what I'm doing and, and, and the way the world works. And that essentially kind of describes what our old nature is. And God describes that to us as being autonomous, uh, rebelliously autonomous and divided. And before God, we achieve our identity. It's all wrapped on what we achieve. And before God and the work through Jesus in us, it's all perceived. We just kind of design it and, and, and uh, determine it on our own. And everybody has to accept that because it's your story and your truth and so on. And that's how our culture is um, addressing these things now. But do you know, do you know for sure, do you know in your, it's kind of a funny way to say it, but I've never forgotten this. Um, I don't even remember who I got this from, but you've probably heard this before. Do you know all the way down in your knower? I don't know what that means, but you can determine it yourself. Just make it up. Do you know all the way down in your bones who God has made, who's designed us to be? It's so compelling that our church leaders got it right up here on the wall. We're a family of missionary servants who are sent as disciples who make reproducing disciples. We are a family of missionary servants sent as disciples who make reproducing disciples. This is essentially who God says His people are. When you belong to Jesus, you become a part of a family who has a missionary outlook, who lives like servants for the purpose of or for the mission of making disciples who are reproducing disciples. So if um, you want a summary, really, essentially, of what we read in God's own words as to who we are, that could be a reasonable summary, theologically. 
And um, God reveals himself to us in the Bible as our Father. That's where he starts. He says he is our Father, similarly, similar to what he reveals to us about his own son, the same father that Jesus had, which makes us adopted children. So we are, when you think about who we are as belongers to Jesus, we are adopted, we are adopted children. We are dearly loved children who are adopted by the father. Famous author, theologian J.I. Packer, when asked this question, he was asked, what is a Christian? His answer is really unique. It's a really fresh way to answer this question. And I'm curious what things come to your mind. If someone were to say to you, so what's a Christian? Uh, um, I still remember when uh, my high school friend said to me, Williams, you're different. And I was like, I mean, I'd love to hear more about where you're going with this, honestly. And he said, "Um, I've noticed that this, that, or the other thing, you know, we're all doing this on the weekends, but you're not. And... I don't know, what, what's with you? And of course, in my um, extremely lame lack of courage, I mentioned to him that, I don't know, I, I go to church. And he's like, cool, so do I. Anyway, that conversation was over. Still thinking about it in my 50s, by the way. I don't know how to define what it meant to be a Christian. I don't know, go to church. But the definition, according to J.I. Packer, is this. J.I. Packer said, the question can be answered in many ways, but the richest answer I know is that the Christian, a Christian, is the one who has God as his father. That's a compelling new insight that is unique to people who belong to Jesus and are adopted by God the Father, the creator of the universe who made you and I in his image. And that's what makes us unique to the world is we have a heavenly father that the world outside of Jesus does not have. And God reveals in the Bible, he reveals in the scripture that he can be our father. He's designed us to be our father. And it's the same father-child relationship that he has with Jesus the Son. Look at this. This is a letter to Rome, the church at Rome, written by Paul the Apostle. And he says, so you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Now, he's talking to people who know all about the spirit of a a fearful slave. These are people enslaved. Uh, The the Jewish people among the, the new church at Rome had generations of slavery, in bondage. And he says, but you received the spirit, and it's not the spirit that makes you a fearful slave anymore. Instead, you received God's spirit. So what? What does that mean? When he adopted you as his own children, now we call him Abba Father. Well, that word Abba Father is a big deal for these Jewish Christians to say. It would indicate intimacy with the creator of the universe who they can't even imagine looking at, much less saying their name. And then he says, no, you know how you call your own father in your home, your human father, dad? That's the kind of father we have now. He's adopted you in such a way as you can call him Abba Father. You can call him dad. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm we're God's children. It's a spiritual thing that happens, and it affirms in our spirits that we belong to God and that we are his adopted child. So what would this language mean to the people who are reading this letter that came from Paul? What would it mean? If you were in the Roman church and you were uh, um, here among these people and you received this letter and you heard it read, when you got to this word um, down here, when you got to this word adopted, that would mean something to you. That word adopted would be very, very vivid. Because um, in the Roman culture, not necessarily the Hebrew culture, but in the Roman culture, adoption usually occurred when a wealthy adult had no heir for his estate. So in a patriarchal society, the father is wealthy and needs to pass on his wealth, and he doesn't have an heir in his own family. And so what that wealthy father would do is adopt someone. It could be a child or a youth. It could be an adult. And at the moment of adoption, several things were immediately true of their new son. 
immediately true. All their old debts and all their legal obligations were paid by the new father. Any debt, any legal obligation settled and satisfied by their new father. Also, they received new honor that they've, the son receives new honor that he never had before, which is a family name that's honored among the community. You go from being nobody to uh, absorbing the family reputation and the honor that comes along with it. In some cases, someone who is of lesser importance becomes significant importance because of the wealth and the adoption. And instantly, the son becomes an heir to inherit all of the father's wealth. Instantly, they become an heir. So when Paul writes about being adopted by the Father in heaven, this is what triggers in their hearing. Their hearing hears this word adoption, and that has some legitimately life-changing significance to it. New Father instantly becomes liable, instantly becomes liable for the new son's actions, their new debts, and their crimes. So the father assumes the risk of debts, crime, and obligations, and all the um, good and bad behavior of their new son. But the new son also has a new obligation, and the new obligation to the adopted father is to honor and please his father. All this lies behind what you're reading here in this passage, that adoption is a powerful picture of what's happening to Christians here in this picture. By the way, it's worth noticing that we receive our sonship status, and that proves that at, there was a time where we didn't have it, right? You wouldn't receive something from the Father, or you wouldn't receive something from God that you already had. We were not naturally God's children. This means that the father-child relationship with God is not automatic. We start originally, and here's a word I didn't throw into the description before Jesus, but originally we start uh, in our relationship with God as orphans and slaves. Orphans and slaves. So the image of adoption tells us that our relationship with God is based completely, this is so important, our relationship with God, our adoptive relationship with God as our Father is based completely on the legal act of the Father. 100% completely reliant on the Father to do the legal work to make it happen. So you and I and the sons who were being adopted, they didn't win a father. They didn't go out and negotiate a father. They didn't perform uh, uh, under certain testing, physical, moral, or spiritual testing or personality testing in order to win the father over. Instead, adoption is a legal act on the part of the father. It's very costly, but it's only costly to the father. There's nothing that the child does to win it or earn it. It is simply received by the child. That's such a great picture, isn't it? It's such a great theological picture of what happens to us when we are adopted into God's family. As adopted children, we enjoy the same favor that Jesus does. As adopted children, much like Jesus, we are meant to hear in our spirit the same thing that Jesus heard when he came out of the waters. You might remember this, that when Jesus came out of the water being baptized, there is a, there is a, um, you can hear the Father saying, you are my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Imagine that Jesus, the Son, hears that from his Father, and when we are joined and belong to Jesus, when we are, our spirit is joined to, be, to affirm that we are God's children, we have that same type of, you are my child. And you can hear this, and when you hear this, prompted by the Holy Spirit in your, in your um, inner being, when you hear this, it's affirmed by the Holy Spirit, it's true, God comforting his child, that you belong to me and I am well pleased because you belong to me. Not because you're performing so well, not because you're executing everything that you're supposed to execute, not because you're about to pull off a stretch of perfection that could make the angels sing, but Why? Because 
I made you in my image, and I have done the hard, suffer love work to redeem you as my own, and I love you because you belong to me. I made you, and you belong to me. It's the highest privilege for us to be able to call the creator of the universe Abba, Father, to be able to call that God Dad, the way that Jesus called his Father, Father, the highest privilege. It's the highest privilege in the Christian life. It's also the deepest longing in our hearts. If you found yourself on occasion longing for affirmation that you belong to somebody who loves you for who you are, you have found him. He created the universe. He happened to create you in his own image. He happens to know every hair on your head. He happens to know you like he has knit you together in your mother's womb, cell by cell. That's available to you. And that God has created you for that type of father-child relationship. Knowing God as our perfect father kind of stands up against the possibility that we had an inadequate human father. It's also um, possible that you have a desire for this type of father and a longing for this type of father a need for this type of father to come in and fill a role and fill a place and fill this level of affirmation in your own heart. And now, through the Father in heaven, as we're adopted as his own child, we now have the father we've always needed and wanted. And we recognize, right, that this isn't the same skin-on father. This isn't the same human father that many of us have learned to love and thrive under their leadership and their love. But it also doesn't mean that you can't find that affirming love to come from the Heavenly Father in a way that our souls need it and find that um, affirmation comforting. If we didn't get all that we wanted or needed in our human fathers, we are invited to, to join the Father in heaven and even more deeply into the pleasure that the Father of heaven and earth takes with His Son and with you, and He invites you into that joy. And invites you into the pleasure that he expresses to Jesus. You are my child, and and, um, you are the one whom I love. And with you, not just with the expert Christians, not just with the long, lifelong Christians, not just to the big givers and big servers and big shots. You, I love you. And don't misunderstand. You can't, this is the Father in heaven, you can't do anything for me that I need. You can't do anything extra to make me love you more. You can't do anything less to make me love you less. I made you, and you belong to me, and you are mine, and that's why I love you. It's such a relief. It's such a relief. And this is how God interacts with us when we think about what it means to be a part of his family. To experience the holy God as our loving father, can you imagine? To approach God without fear, feeling like, oh, I'm a slave and I'm entering the presence of my master. No more spirit of fear. No more spirit of slave. He just wants me to work for him and perform for him and and, and do things that benefit him. To be assured of his fatherly care and concern, life-changing. Absolutely life-changing. J.I. Packer says this, to be right with God, the judge, is a great... Did you already read this? Raise your hand if you've already read this. <laughs> Father, you see these, you see them, you see them. It's hard not to, right? To be right with God the judge is a great thing, isn't it? We've got God the judge, and he's going to judge us, and to be made right with God, which is called righteousness, being in right standing with the Father, such a great thing. But, Jay Packer says, that's pretty cool, but to be loved and to be cared for by God the Father is even greater than being right with God the judge. And now, I don't know about you, but I tend to think, thank God I'm not being judged by the Father. There's there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm so glad I'm not going to be condemned by the Father because of my trust in Jesus. And then I hardly ever get to this part. It's even better to be loved and cared for by the creator of the universe. That's pretty cool. That's worth focusing on. That's worth putting my roots into and seeing my relationship defined that way. If we are adopted members of the family, if we are, we are his heirs. We are his heirs. 
we have an inheritance waiting for us. If we are adopted members of the family, we are his heirs. You might see in your notes future heirs, right? Like there's a future inheritance. There's an inheritance waiting for us. Check this out. This is also in in Romans 8. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. He calls all Christians heirs of God's glory. It's, of course, that's a miracle, right? Because the heir gets the lion's share of the parent's wealth. So that's kind of miraculous. Together with Jesus, we've been included in, his, in the Father's will. When the reading happens, we're included. We're a part of it. And in the will, here's what we're going to find. There are such things as the Father leaves us to inherit a resurrected, glorified body, the best version of yourself that you could ever imagine, the one that hasn't been tainted and damaged and decayed by sin and disease. That one, that one body. You may have already picked it out on Instagram. That's yours. Also, we are going to inherit a new heaven and a new earth, all restored back to its glorious beauty, like Eden. A a, a paradise of both physical enjoyment and also spiritual enjoyment and contentment. We also stand to inherit a family to spend eternity with. Now, I want before you get too far, it isn't going to be, you know, the family that you're familiar with. This is going to be a spotless family who's doing things God's way. There's no sin or selfishness in your family, and that's a game changer. This is the family who, you'll notice, is all enjoying a life that's free from pain and tears, a, a, a life free from disease and a life free from death ongoing, eternal family care and love for one another. But that's still not the best part. As Jesus prayed just before he was arrested, he made our inheritance with him very, very plain. Look at what he says. This is his prayer to the Father. Father, before he's arrested, he says, I want these whom you have given me, my disciples, I want, uh, I want them to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. So what does Jesus say? I want them with me. And so this is the best part. I mean, streets of gold, pretty cool. No tears, no death, no disease, no no dying. That's fascinating, right? Absolutely hard to even imagine. But even better, your upgrade, the thing that is incomparable, the infinite value and worth of being in heaven is being with your rescuing Savior, the Lamb of God, Jesus, who is there with us. And then we get to behold him, and we get to behold all his glory for how long? Well, I don't know how long eternity is, but it seems like really long. It's a long time. That's how long it's going to take to fully enjoy the glory of Jesus. It's going to take a long time. And we get to be with him. It's an answer to prayer that Jesus uh, prays to the Father before he's taken from us in the earth. And we are inheritance of that future. Not a lone, wandering hope. And it also means, side note, we don't have to be afraid of death anymore. It also means we can stand up under death and there's no more sting, right, of death. Death is still, it brings grief, but the sting is gone. Why? Because one day when you belong to Jesus, we are going to be with him and we're going to see all the glory that the Father gave Jesus. And we'll behold him and worship him in all his glory forever. So what does this mean for us here among the North Central Church family? What does this mean for us? Do you know the Father's intent for us is not just to know this and nod about this and think this is really helpful for me personally. This actually means something more. What this means is that he has saved you out of isolation in isolation and individualism, and he has saved you into a family. He saved you out of living alone, and he saved you into a community. You don't just get fra- saved from something. Jesus saves you to something. Does that make sense? It's not just pulling something out, it's adding something to our lives. 
and we learn to submit to God as our Father as adopted sons and daughters who love each other as brothers and sisters. And as you know, sometimes brother and sister love can be pretty tough, right? Anybody ever taken a, a, um, either an inadvertent or advertent um, shot from one of your siblings? Some of you have had some roughneck experiences with your brothers and sisters, and sometimes family love is the harshest and hardest love, the most hurtful love. It's no mistake that God calls us a family, that He doesn't come up with a new name to say, like, you were with your earthly family, but now I have something new for you, and it's called a tribe. He doesn't say that. It's like what you've experienced in your family is similar to what you're going to experience with my family. The difference is there's going to be humble repentance and humble confession and humble forgiveness. And there's going to be a new way to operate with each other, and that is to bear one another's weaknesses and burdens, not condemn one another for our weaknesses and burdens. There's, in other words, there's new rules in my family. There's new joy in my family. And that family comes through grasping and enjoying the beauty of God's grace to forgive us. So here's what it means. We here among our the North Central church body is a family, and we're also a part of a greater family, which I'm thrilled to be a part of. We're a part of God's family around the world, Jesus following, Jesus trusting family. If you've been adopted into his family around the world, then we're a part of that. So we're a local family, one of many um, here in the north central New York area. So we get to be children of God who love and care for one another as a family, as his family, with one father. And as family, we see it as our individual responsibility to personally care for the needs of people who belong to the family. We contribute our time, talent, and treasure, our special abilities to help strengthen the church body and make the church body as strong as it's supposed to be. We get to participate. We get to uh, contribute in that area. And... um, this is something that you'll, you'll of course, uh, this, we are a family of missionary servants sent as disciples. You'll get this same type of kind of language and teaching in our roots track. If you've been, you've heard it. If you haven't, that's what you will hear. It's so compelling to us that it has to be in front of us on our wall and the way that we um, think of ourselves. God has always desired a people. He's always planned to have an earthly family who would live in such a way that the world will be able to see this is what it looks like. This is who he is. They would be able to see it and experience what God's like. And through Jesus, we're designed to live in this family. We're designed as children of God and to be brothers and sisters with each other. Those who, Jesus says, those who live my way and those who obey my Father, he says, are truly my family. How do we know who they are? They're living Jesus' way and they're also obeying the Father in heaven. That's how you know who belongs. Now, we start that belonging with a water baptism. People say, I put my faith in Jesus, I've joined my faith. Uh, I've joined my, I put my trust in Jesus. I trust his work, his life, his death instead of my own. And then God saves us. And then water baptism says, hey, I have an announcement to make. Um, Most of you don't know this, but in my own heart, I have made Jesus my rescuing savior. And then there was an adoption where I now belong to God's family, and I just wanted to go public with my faith. And then what do you and I get to do? We get to cheer and celebrate of the miraculous transformation that occurs when someone goes from death to life, or someone goes from lost to found. We call that water baptism. And we celebrate as a family. We'll do that on Easter morning, a great symbol of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So that means here among us, we are all now bonded by our unified worship of Jesus. We're no longer bonding primarily through the fact that we're Italian, so take that. (laughs) Take that. 
That's no longer our primary bond that we're French, Irish, German, English, Swedish, Welch, or any other ethnicity. That's no longer our primary bond. Isn't it fun to find your own a little bit? But now, no more race walls, no more gender walls, no more ethnicity walls, no more culture walls. Why? Because we are in unified harmony and we're bonded around the work of Jesus to adopt us into his own family and become one of his brothers and sisters. And we get to rejoice in that every Sunday and sing songs about all that he is and all that he's done to gather us up. And we should be very, very attentive to the way that age politics, race, and culture divides us. We should be very attentive to all the ways that that divides us and say, it might divide some who don't belong to Jesus. It's not dividing me and my church family. I will respectfully disagree with someone's naive incompetence. Just kidding, just kidding. I will um, find myself bonded more tightly around who Jesus is than divided among all the other divisive issues, even if it's morality. So, um, as a family, really quick, as a family, you know, what, you know what we're taught as a family? Here's what we're taught, that if, that the men among the church family are to treat older women as mothers and to treat younger women as sisters. And ladies, I want you to imagine coming out of the creepy self predatory type of culture, the way that people function. And I want you to imagine walking into a family where you are treated, by men, you are treated like a mom if you're older and like a sister if you're younger. And you have the freedom to be and you have the freedom to love and you have the freedom to spend time with and enjoy the life of men who see you as a part of their family and to escape being objectified outside of the church family. And also, if you are an older man or you're an older woman, you get the joy of being told in the New Testament that what the church does is this. Older men and older women, they get around younger women and younger men and they pass their faith on. We call that around here men's ministries and women's ministries, the passing on of one's faith to the younger generation. Why would we do that? Because we're a family. And we would supplement what's happening inside our homes when we are making disciples in our homes and the church family comes along and supplements that imperfectly but also intentionally and on purpose. We care for each other through regular, corporate, large group meetings. We care for each other by uh, um, consistent involvement in a smaller group. You've probably noticed, I hope you've noticed, that... um, You can't settle for a Sunday morning large group gathering to meet the family need, right? Another meeting in between Sundays is needed. More time is needed. Also, let me caution anyone who is beginning to depend on a live stream online worship service to be your church family. Let me caution you about that. That's as much of your family as a family meal is with FaceTime at the table, right? Most of us would not be satisfied that we're having family meals if everybody, you just set up your camera, everybody just sets up their phones and we've got a FaceTime gathering, right? Anybody else would find that eventually a little unfulfilling? What do you need? You need to see who belongs to you. You need to love who belongs to you. You need to hear from who belongs to you. And what we have with our live stream online Uh, service is a tool to help you stay connected if you would otherwise be disconnected. But it cannot replace brothers being with sisters and sisters being with brothers who are gathering under the worship of the Father in heaven who's adopted us into a family. It's a great tool to stay connected. I caution you about ever letting it replace your family. And I don't have to caution any of you, hey, don't settle for your family meal is by FaceTime. I don't have to caution anybody about that. We know that's not a family meal. Let me caution you um, about the temptation to just arrive on a Sunday morning and see yourself as a, uh, someone who is aiming to be a, f- a friendly attender, to be an attender who's friendly. Because I already know that you don't need more friendly attenders or friendly acquaintances. You need friends. We need friends. So when you think about the people in the church family, don't think of them as somebody that you're supposed to be friendly to. Think of them as somebody who you could be friends with. 
And that takes time, right? To have real trusted friends takes time, but it also sometimes takes being a catalyst. It takes initiating rather than waiting. And I also caution you about waiting for the church staff to provide those friendships for you or to provide those environments. We take it serious to help small groups happen. Men, women, uh, Encore students, uh, CTC, uh, we're, we're presently, we would love to see something spring up that's meaningful as it relates to in-person with kids. It's a tough one to pull off, but the need is severe for that. But it happens proactively by pursuing people to become friends and to spend time getting under the surface with just a few people. Be cautious about letting yourself remain a spectator who's getting entertained in the seat rather than a contributor who's pitching in to bring strength with your special abilities, your giving of your time, talent, and treasures. Be cautious about that. It's, it's uh, imperative to become a part of a family. And some people find their way in easier than others. There's so many dynamics that affect that. And certainly, uh, my, I'm always praying that we're a more open and friendly and engaging church who's desiring to make friends, not just to, to be friendly on Sunday. But it's um, so significant. By the way, if you are looking for an environment to kind of get in a little bit, to find your 12, get a little bit deeper than you can get in a large group on Sunday and you haven't yet done that through small groups, there's a QR code that's um, right there in front, of the, in front of you on the seat back, and that will take you to expressing interest in being a part of a small group. Men, women, 55-plus students, CTC. Somebody's inspired to start up an in-person with kids. That would be... Uh, huge step in the right direction for so many people. So what do we do now? Really quick, join God's family by believing and receiving your adoption. If you're not yet in the family, by the way, let me remind you that you don't belong to God's family because of your family heritage. You don't belong to God's family because of your attendance and your tenure, right? You don't belong to God's family because you've paid your dues You might call it an offering, but you've paid your dues and you know for sure you belong to God's family. And you also don't get, you're not adopted into God's family by your moral standards. Instead, how are we adopted? But to all, Jesus says. But to all who believed him and received him or accepted him. He gave the right to become a child of God. By believing and receiving yourself in your heart as the Holy Spirit gives you the ability to do that. You say, I am going to believe that Jesus' work and his life, death, burial, that takes my place, his life of perfection, his moral perfection, that counts as my, and I'm trusting his work over mine. Imagine it this way. Imagine an orphanage and imagine yourself in the orphanage and one day, there was a, a car that pulls up, and it's a wealthy, it's, it's the wealthiest person in town pulls up, and their son gets out of their car. And you see in the orphanage, the son goes and talks to the people at the front desk, and you see somebody nod at the front desk. And then the son starts walking through the orphanage, and the son starts to extend his hands to you and to every other orphan in the orphanage and says, I love you and my Father has chosen you, and I want to save you from this slavery, this orphan, this this emptiness, and this uh, um, despair, and and, and this spirit of fear that you have. I want to save you. And the Son just starts going like this. Receive me. Would you accept this invitation? Would you accept this invitation? And that son scoops up and rescues everyone who believes what the son is offering and accepts their love. One by one, that son starts taking people and packing up this wealthy father's car. That isn't any different than what the heavenly father has done for us by sending his son and who opens his nail-scarred hands and says, I just... Just believe that I am who I say I am and receive my forgiveness. Receive it. It's a free gift. Would you receive it? And when you respond to that, he scoops you up and you no longer live with a spirit of slave, fear. You now start your new life as a child of God, adopted, forgiven, as an an heir of what's coming. 
What belongs to him is going to belong to you. Everyone who believes and receives his invitation is adopted into his wealthy family. And you get everything that the son has. It belongs to you. By grace, that becomes yours. By his grace. So, do you believe? Would you accept that invite today? If you're watching on live stream, would you accept that invitation today to join God's family? Not to join our church, but to join God's family. Also, I want to encourage you to take an initial step, if you haven't yet, take an initial step to get out of isolation and into a smaller group of people who you begin to develop friendship with, who you share your life with, who sometimes are prickly, but most of the time, they're who God wants you to be with, care for, and love. Find your 12 disciples between Sundays. It doesn't happen passively, and it doesn't happen happen rapidly. It happens over time, but it takes intentionality. And I would love to think that some of you would be a catalyst to start a handful of a group of people on your own. And when you get with them, you get time to really, really ask questions and care and listen to understand. And you get to say, where's your heart at? How, what are the things that you find your heart believing about the gospel now? Or what are the things you find yourself doubting about the gospel now? And let God work in that relationship. Would you pray with me this morning? Father, we're so grateful that your word is true and it's what we need. I pray for those who are isolated and alone today. I recognize that some of those people may have been isolated, alone, and haven't yet joined the life of the family. And there are others who have joined the life of the family who are still feeling alone. And I pray, God, that everything that they need, they would find in you. You would provide it. You would become it that they would learn um, to experience Abba, Father, that you're their dad. And they would learn to experience your family with brothers and sisters who love them and help carry their burdens and forgive them and all the other things. And ultimately, God, we pray that you'd deepen their lives with relationships. We know you can do it and we trust you to do it. We pray these things in Jesus' strong name who makes it possible. Amen. Would you stand? We're going to sing this truth together and sing it like we mean it.